How many times in your life have you played a game so good that you knew all you had to do was send your friend a message saying play this without any other description and know they were going to have a fantastic time? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Outer Wilds. And no spoiler intro for you there. We are going to talk about some spoilers later, but we'll let you know before we get there. What is The Outer Wilds? This was a game that I just saw on Steam. Space exploration, mystery. I love that stuff. I'm a big Star Trek fan. So I picked it up. What happened was one of the best games I've ever played. I sent a message over to Nups on Discord saying, just try it. And then we did something interesting. He logged his playthrough back to me. He then watched my VODs and how we differed how our roads separated ultimately going back to the same point. So it's an experience I'd really like to share with you guys as well. So here's Nups to get us started. Now the premise of the Outer Wilds is really simple. You are a young Hearthian astronaut and you're about to go on your very first space voyage. You're given a newly invented piece of tech, which is a machine that translates scripture from an old civilization called the Nomai that has gone long, long extinct. Your only mission is to go out there and use your spaceship to visit the various planets within your solar system and see if there's anything new you can find using this new machine. That's it. You're on your own. There's no quest marker to guide you along the way. It's you, your spaceship, your spacesuit, a signal scope, a probe launcher and this new machine that translates the scripture. It's up to your imagination and most importantly, your curiosity to guide you along a path to find out what happened to this Nomai civilization, how they came to be within the solar system, and how they unfortunately became to be extinct. So, here we go. You launch your spaceship for the first time and you look around you. What do I explore first? That sun-beaten ash planet looks interesting, or... Hey, what's that satellite that orbits our enormous sun? No, no. I'm going to that planet with the volcanic moon. Now that looks cool. Uh, the incredible thing about this game is that this choice of where you choose to start your journey does and doesn't matter at the same time. No matter where you go, you will find interesting pieces to an intriguing puzzle, yet simultaneously your choice will put you on your very own journey that will very likely be completely different from any other player. You might well find a piece of information at the very start of the game that gives you a first inkling of an idea of what's going on, while to another player, that same piece of information was the last puzzle piece that they needed to connect everything together at the very end of their playthrough. This is exactly what happened between me and Mike, and neither of our playthroughs became weaker through this. In fact, it blew our minds how we managed to enjoy this world in such different orders, and discover things out of the blue that the other had to work very hard for, and we still ended up funneling into the same ending, both having undertaken an absolutely incredible but unique journey. Subverting expectations has become something of a meme in modern era, with shows like Game of Thrones throwing it to the wolves, yet the Outer Wilds is the demonstration of how to do it perfectly. The entire game plays off what you expect to find. And the problem is our imaginations are so full and so powerful that what we expect to find is often better than what we actually find. And that's not the way this works. Think about the starting presentation of what you're seeing on your screen. This almost comedic, cartoony, laid back lifestyle of simple farmers on a planet that have managed to rig together a rocket ship with seemingly bed planks and old sheets. What do you expect to find when you go up there? Silly things. 
That's not what happens though. When you first rise above those clouds and enter space, you are presented with an entire solar system of things and your brain instantly starts to calculate what you would expect to find. And more importantly, it also starts to suggest things that are probably not relevant. Internally, any game we play that has some element of mystery, our brains, if you've played one before, will generate a sort of checklist. Things that you will no doubt happen, some sort of twist, we're going to find this out, we'll meet a character early that turns out to be something different, yet in the Outer Wilds, that's never the case. It's never the case. Every single planet we visit presents to us what we think we're going to deal with, and then it does something different. And more importantly... It does it better than what our imaginations can deal with. I think a great way of looking at this is actually the music in the game, which is phenomenal from start to finish. But more importantly is the one theme track. I can't remember a game in my history where one simple, simple short song has not only been able to instill a sense of calm, relaxation, and happiness in me, while that same song can also instill in me a complete sense of panic and irrationality and a need and a desire and a fury and a frenzy that this song managed to generate. With that said, we can't really go further without having a few spoilers, so spoiler time. So let our journey begin, shall we? But where to go? This game offers you an entire solar system of playgrounds to go and play in. And it depends on your person as to which way you go. In fact, me and Nups diverted immediately upon leaving our home planet. I decided to follow what seemingly was suggested by the game. Typically when I play a game, I'll follow the game's instructions, even in an open world, until I feel the game has, quote unquote, opened up and not knowing what to expect with the game i expected that thing as well little did i know the game had opened up already so i went to the moon the game had kind of pointed me in that direction and i want to be clear on something here i was almost about to not play this game anymore i didn't know what i was getting into nobody had recommended it to me but it seemed cartoony it seemed kind of goofy there was some floating around with a backpack i had seen little games like this before and i kind of thought this isn't going anywhere and landing on the moon didn't make that any better. While I had some fun landing my spaceship for the first time while I was still not great with controlling it, I used a keyboard and mouse and Nups went with a controller, but I found it actually no problem to deal with keyboard and mouse while playing this game. I landed on it and it started to teach me some basic things, like shooting my probe. I can shoot a probe which will send back still images of what it sees along the way, allowing me to explore a planet from one position by simply sending the probe curving over the horizon. What did I expect to see here? The space nerd in me was hoping for aliens, some sort of war, something interesting going on. What did I find? Basically a farmer chilling in a camp by a campfire on the moon. Obviously curiosity and trying out a new game, I went to have a conversation with him and had some rather banal conversation. Now, this is what's interesting. The game never explicitly tells you what you're doing. It sends you out with a very simple goal explore the only difference between you and the other astronauts that have already been sent out into the solar system is that you have a piece of tech that allows you to translate messages left by an ancient race go and find out what they say that's your mission but when you go out and you're sitting there you're kind of thinking huh these few sentences talk about some old projects and it's not that interesting but then suddenly some music kicks in and what do you see well, I didn't actually notice at first. It's interesting looking back at my first playthrough is despite the fact that the music had kicked in, indicating that time was up, I didn't know that was going to happen. I had no idea the game was on a repeating cycle. And I didn't even notice that the sun in the system was expanding. Or that all the lights in the stars were disappearing. As I turned my head and the music was playing, I saw the shockwave moving towards me. The solar system is about to come to an end. And I stared, gobsmacked as it enveloped the planet, and then suddenly I was plopped back onto the home world, and then it dawned on me. Oh, it's like Miura's mask. The day's repeating. Now, this is where it gets even more interesting, because this is where the game instills in you a sense of player-made goals. What is now my goal? Well, the game prompted me to go and explore this ancient world, but clearly, clearly, my goal is now to save my home world there must be a way of stopping this sun from going supernova. That is exactly what I would expect from 
a game like this that's just presented it. When I look up in Miura's mask and I see that moon crashing into Terminus, I expect that I'm going to stop that from happening. And that is exactly what the creators wanted you to think. But unfortunately, that is absolutely not what's going to happen. In fact, this game deals with such a heavy topic. And that is the heat death of the universe. The lights are going out. The darkness is here. And absolutely nothing you can do can stop it. And I can't tell you as I expressed and played out throughout the game, starting on this simple moon with a disappointing farmer, how small I would feel by the end of it. How futile it would feel, but how extraordinary it was to explore it. My first stop after launch was actually Timber Hearth, our home planet. I wanted to start as small as possible on my journey as an astronaut and discover what our home planet had to offer in terms of discoveries. And as it turns out, there's a lot of setup for some endgame pieces of the puzzle here. Now at this point in time, you have no idea what any of these will mean for your progression, but it gives you a couple of directions to work towards in your ship log. For example, the first thing I came across was a seed that had crash landed all the way from Dark Bramble which by all intents and purposes is sort of a late game planet. Mind when I say late game here is that nothing is stopping you from going to Dark Bramble. In fact, I could have traveled there as my first stop without any issue. You will just be missing a couple of clues that will allow for more effective navigation of that planet instead of having to use trial and error to find your way around. One of those clues being that you can fire your scout into a seed node and take pictures as it travels in the dimension beyond. As I mentioned in my intro, the beautiful thing about Outer Wilds is that if this is your first clue you find in a game, it will simply create a pathway of further exploration. But for Mike, who didn't explore the home planet until the very end, it could mean lighting up the final bulb that makes up the strategy of uncovering the most important piece that Dark Bramble has to offer. As I explore further, I find one of the few if not the only connection between the Nomai and our race the Herthians. Inside the warm waters of several geysers are mentions of how the Nomai witnessed the genesis of our species as we emerged from the waters many thousands of years ago. The Nomai were careful not to disturb our peaceful evolution to becoming a sentient and intelligent species by moving their mining operations to a different location instead. This immediately gives a lot of context to the nature of the Nomai their intent and how long it must have been since their civilization thrived within our solar system. Not much later, I find these old caves that held the mining operations and provided the resources needed to protect and encase something called the Ash Twin Project. More on that later. I also find a place that houses a quantum shard related to the quantum moon both setting me on paths towards some very crucial pieces of gameplay that tie in to the ending of the game. Of course, at this point, I don't have the slightest of inclinations of what any of these clues mean, but within the span of 22 minutes, I've given myself several directions to work towards, birthed completely out of my own choice, without the game itself telling me to walk any designed path. While Timberhearth might have been designed with this purpose in mind, the same process would have happened if I had chosen a different planet to visit first, just in a different permutation, and that's such clever game design. My next stop was the Interloper, a comet that I had seen from the first 10 minutes of the game, just circling the solar system and in my brain, going back to that subverting expectations, what I saw was background scenery, something that I don't expect to see in a space game. But throughout my play, I found more and more messages retaining to the interloper. It's traveling and there's something dangerous there, something we need to investigate. The Nomai were clearly curious about this comet. So, why not? Let's go and check it out. Kind of hard to meet as it's traveling through the solar system at some speed, but lo and behold, you can land on it. And what did I find? A comet, covered in ice. Nothing of particular interest and walking around it until that comet passed by the star. And the heat of that sun started to melt the ice. Of course, and my brain clicked in. Of course that's what would happen. 
I didn't expect that to happen because typically that wouldn't happen in a video game. But here we are as more and more caverns and mountains started to appear on this comet. And then a crashed ship with some logs. The Nomai detailing that they had to investigate this because they could detect something wasn't right. Something's not right with this comet that has arrived in the star system. So in they go. And what do we find in there? Poison. Just natural poison that had wiped them out. The corpses of these Nomai who we'd heard about, we've learned about through logs, care about each other, have fun with each other, and hear their corpses lie. Right inside a comet. And why? Just because that's the way things went. No matter their grandiose plans and grandiose technology and their incredible plan in order to try and save themselves and bring their unity, they just died because a comet turned up. And that comet contained something that wiped them out. And it was incredibly sad. My next stop was Giant's Deep. Giant's Deep is the planet that you can see immediately as you spawn after the restart of the day. And on it, I could see explosions happening. In my brain, I translated that as this was a planet at war. I actually decided to leave this till later because I wasn't ready to deal with that. I wanted to explore what seemingly were the safer planets in the system before dealing with a planet that was in the midst of a battle. But the day came and it was time to visit Giant's Deep. As I approached it, I was cautious. I was wary that we might be fl flying in to tank shell fire, laser cannons, God knows what was going on this planet. And as soon as I passed through the dense cloud, and God did they do this so well, as you have this slow, slow descent onto this enormous planet, the biggest planet in the system, is that you find it's not a war at all. In fact, it's a planet of seawater, and it is ravaged by dangerous storms. Immediately, I had to make course corrections. Dealing with this situation as I was flying headfirst into a tornado, looking for anywhere to land on a planet entirely encompassed with water. Flying around, I could see that the, the levels were changing. The tide was going in and out, and it was super dangerous. And then I see a landmass. Landing on the landmass and wondering what's going to happen next, the water rose and lifted my ship up, threw it into the atmosphere. A tornado passed over me, throwing me high sky high. Once I got my bearings, I start to explore a little bit more. And what do I find? A fellow astronaut lying on his bed, confused, given up, completely at peace with the fact that every day he wakes up here, he gets thrown into the air sometime with passing tornadoes. But then there's more. And this is exactly why this game is so good. There's so much more. An enormous tornado. How do we penetrate it? Flying near it is dangerous. It's going to rip our ship apart. But what if we're in a spaceship? Can we go over the top? Yes, you can. You can fly down right into the eye of the tornado and find a hidden gem. But even more than that, what if we go underwater? So out of pure curiosity, which is what this game encourages, I deep dive under the water and there I see something. A structure protected by a shield. What more could be happening here? What an exciting adventure. From thinking I was going to walk into a battle to find a water planet ravaged by storms and so much stuff hidden beneath it. What a dream. Pritzel Hollow was up next for me. Possibly the planet with the most ways to make your life difficult as you try to navigate its dense infrastructure both on the out and inside of the planet. Inside this hollow planet, you find a black hole that relentlessly sucks anything that enters its event horizon and spits it out of the white hole pretty much on the other side of the solar system. I can't stress how much fun I had playing around with the physics on Brittle Hollow, flinging myself around to distant platforms by using its strong gravity, while simultaneously observing and comparing my playthrough with Mike's, and how much he was getting wrecked by this black hole. Viewers of the stream will probably remember Mike's antics as he feverishly tries to avoid being sent to the middle of nowhere by his best friend the black hole, and they will also remember that this is how he found White Hole Station. The teleportation space station that will send you back to Brittle Hollow and introduces you to the mechanics of warping as invented by the Nomai. This however is not how I found it. Even before ever going to Brittle Hollow, I was just mooching around the interloper as I noticed a strange white anomaly in the distance that the comet just happened to be passing by on its elliptical orbit around the sun. Double checking my space map, this anomaly had no marker and nothing indicating it was a place of interest, but my interest was certainly piqued. 
I launched off of the interloper and parked my ship next to the white hole and proceeded to EVA into the nearby space station that turned out to be the warp tower to Bittle Hollow. I know I keep going on about how insanely cool it is to be allowed to explore with complete free reign, but to me, the way I just happened to discover Whitehall Station and Mike relaying back just how mind-blowing that was to him served as a firm indicator that this game was starting to become a contender for my game of the year. Another example of this came in the form of the Sun Station. This is a device that orbits the Sun very closely and was built with the purpose of detonating the Sun in order to utilize the enormous blast to power the Ashtwin project. What this means exactly I will get to a bit later, but the way to get to this station as intended is through a warp tower. Not for me however, as after discovering Whitehall Station the way I did, I was hungry to try and see if I could break any more intended pathways by sheer brute force. And brute force it took in order to enter a similar orbit around the sun and park my ship near the sun station with vast blasts of heat and pulls of gravity making it difficult, but not impossible for me to force my way inside. After several attempts, I finally make it and I'm rewarded with some incredible pieces of information that I wasn't really supposed to know yet. Back to Brittle Hollow, however, and its vast amounts of challenges. To pick out one of many, I came across a wonderfully detailed Nomai settlement that housed and educated their population for many years as they studied the solar system and worked on their various projects. And what do you know? At the top is another piece of the puzzle called the Black Hole Forge, and once more, the intended way to get there is through a warp tower. It's just so much more fun to wriggle your ship inside the city, fight the black hole trying to suck you in, and park upside down on the artificial gravity floor, right? I imagine that this time, however, many players did it this way, as the warp tower that links up with this place is not actually that trivial to find. The strategy of just flying your spaceship to where it really isn't supposed to stops the moment you try to solve the problem of the Tower of Quantum Knowledge. This place serves to teach you an important rule of navigating the quantum moon, which Mike will tell you about in a little bit. Pieces of the gravity wall that lead you upwards have been broken off, and the pillars surrounding the inside of the tower are too close together to squeeze a spaceship through. It took both of us quite a bit of time to figure out what to do, with our brains still not quite fathoming the possibilities in game design that this world allows for. Quite elegantly, however, the solution presents itself after the tower eventually collapses into the black hole, after a direct hit from a piece of the volcanic moon. If you happen to be along for the ride as it falls into the black hole, you'll of course find yourself suddenly be weightless and free to explore the upper levels of the tower. How obvious, right? But somehow, much like the sun warming up the ice on the interloper, this is normally not what's allowed to happen in a video game. Outer Wilds challenges this, and overrules standard video game convention, which only serves to add to a truly wonderful gameplay loop. I'm onto my final leg of my journey, and it's time to visit Dark Bramble. I had heard about Dark Bramble, about some parasite that had grown inside a planet and ripped it apart. I had also heard about anglerfish, which I thought was a joke. Obviously, when someone mentions an anglerfish to you, you think of an anglerfish. They look quite scary, but are no big threat. But approaching Dark Bramble, the music became ominous. Scary. My first visit here, I took maybe 10 minutes just passing the entranceway. Inside a deep fog. Can't see what's happening. No idea what lies 30 meters in front of my face. So we start shooting probes. What's in there? And there, before me, an enormous anglerfish. Terrifying, sleeping, waiting for me. And instantly your brain kicks in is, if I move near this, it's going to eat me. The game has no way to explain it other than knowing that's what you will do and that being correct. So what do we do inside Dark Bramble? It's full of portals, wormholes that lead to various areas. Firing off probes into these portals can often lead the probe back to your ship. A maze is what Dark Bramble is. And a maze that holds many, many, many secrets. 
Delving into that is possibly the best experience I've had in a video game in years, if not one ever. The atmosphere inside here with the ominous music and knowing that all around you can hear the groaning, growling of these anglerfish, and as soon as they get you, it's game over, the day's going to restart and you've got to try again. So you cautiously pop your thrusters and start using your momentum to travel around so you can silently pass them. There's a horrifying moment in here where you finally start to work out how to traverse Dark Bramble and you move into one of the portals and beyond it lie three sleeping anglerfish. And how do you get through it? You're going to have to fire your thrusters full pelt into that portal and then cut all engines and try and sail past them. And they've timed it so well that even at full speed, you're only just going to make it. Meaning that your ship is going to lose all its momentum just about passing them and coming to a complete crawl as their eyes are right upon you. Inside, of course, we find the Nomai ship. The crash ship that contains the final element of our puzzle in order to break this cycle. And on board, we find out so much detail about how close they were, how great the Nomai were doing, yet all the tattered dreams of what they hoped to accomplish just falling apart. Dark Bramble is more horrifying to me than Silent Hill or Resident Evil could ever be. And it did it all without telling me what was in there. <sighs> After dealing with Dark Bramble and uncovering the puzzle... You finally have all the elements to deal with the quantum moon. The quantum moon is something that is hinted at and you will have seen many, many times. As soon as you set off on your probably first day of playing Outer Wilds or the first rotation, you're likely to see the quantum moon. But the quantum moon has an interesting property that is pronounced to you throughout various planets in the solar system. You're going to find different ways the Nomai tried to track the quantum moon. And the quantum moon has very interesting properties, such as it needs to be remain in your eyesight in order for it to exist. And if it leaves your eyesight, it will disappear. Which is why throughout the game, while you're investigating these big obvious planets like Giant's Deep, you're likely to see the quantum moon, then as you adjust your course, it's disappeared. And you think nothing of it. It's something that exists in the corner of your eye. Earlier in my playthrough, I actually ended up directly in front of it and decided to try and land on it. And they did a clever thing of obscuring the landing with cloud. So as I moved through the cloud, I lost visibility of the planet, meaning that once I passed through the cloud layer, it was gone. What to do? And this is where you find out that Outer Wilds has given you every single tool you need to complete this game from the very first initial cycle. There is no more items to collect, only knowledge. But you know, once you're dealing with something, you have everything to solve this problem. So how do we solve this problem? Well, quite simple. We can take a picture of it. If we put a probe outside the moon and have it focused on it through the camera, then something's watching it and it can't disappear. And lo and behold, victory as we land on the quantum moon. But what's on the quantum moon? A simple building. A simple building that turns the lights out and closes the door. And what does that result in? Well, we can't see the planet anymore. We have some lights in there to deal with. And again, it comes back to your instincts. I have everything I need to make this work. But I don't know how to make it work. Opening the door, if you're unsure what to do, will present with the quantum moon being buried in some sort of rock. You can't escape the building. So what do you do? Some buttons in order to move it around to different planets. You recognize at this point the different logos for the different planets. So you try and you try and you try different things. No success. Ultimately, you could do one of two things. You can either brute force it by trying every different thing in the book because you do have the solutions or you can use the knowledge you learned through exploration in order to solve the problem but once you solve the problem that's when the fun begins what do we find on the quantum moon a nomai a living alien and this is where this game moved from fantastic to absolutely stellar because we need to talk to this nomai so how do we communicate with a species that we can read what they're writing, but we can't communicate verbally. And via the use of just a few tablets in different permutations, we were able to have full conversations with this alien. And it was one of the most mystical, rewarding, fulfilling experiences I can express. Simply putting these together and developing and devising different questions in my head using these tablets, I was able to garner as much knowledge as possible in order to move towards the final endgame. Before we understand what to do in the endgame though, we need to explore the Hourglass Twins. The red planet being the Ember Twin, and the other being the Ash Twin. 
As time passes, the gravitational influence one twin has over the other changes, which results in sand flowing between them in a rather violent event over the course of about 20 minutes, giving this two-planet system its iconic name. The Ember Twins' crevices and cave structures slowly fill up with sand, while the Ash Twin shrinks in size as it loses all of its sand, revealing several warp towers and energy devices. This creates what I find the most clever place in the solar system, in how each objective on these planets requires a different timing. Do you want to explore the bottom of the lake bed on the Ember Twin? Then you'll have to rush there as fast as you can from the moment you wake up, as you have very little time before the caves containing clues to the quantum phenomenon quickly fill up with sand, shutting you out or, even worse, trapping and crushing you inside. Do you want to explore the Ash Twin instead? Well, then you'll actually have to go there late enough in the loop for the sand to have transferred to the other twin, revealing the structures of interest. Such a structure on the Ember Twin is the High Energy Lab, which was one of the main research hubs of the Nomai as they discovered the time delay between an object disappearing into the black hole after it had already surfaced from its corresponding white hole. With enough additional power, they theorized they could stretch this delay and perhaps use the technology to help them find the eye of the universe. The thing is, the power necessary for this project would approach the size of a cataclysmic event like a supernova, which the Nomai actually tried to artificially induce using the sun station I visited earlier. What a bunch of mad lads. This energy would be funneled into the towers that were revealed as the sand leaves the Ash Twin. The towers pierce through an enormously dense core, strengthened with ore from the mining operations on Timper Hearth, in order to protect the Ash Twin project from the blast of the supernova. A warp tower on the surface of the Ash Twin teleports you inside this core, revealing the crux of this entire time loop. Here, I found the masks that I kept seeing while peeking inside of the project, using projection stones found on the other planets. The masks link up with the statues found scattered across the solar system, one of which we as players paired up with at the start of the playthrough. Through these devices, our memories of a loop that had just happened are able to be sent back in time to the player that is just waking up at the campfire. Inside further protective casing, you'll find an advanced warp core manufactured at the black hole forge found on Brittle Hollow, which creates the black hole during the supernova necessary for the time loop. This means that breaking the time loop is a requirement when trying to warp to the eye of the universe, since we know the warp core present on the vessel stranded in Dark Bramble was shattered upon its crash landing. This sets up for the exciting final run, in which you will not be protected by the time loop, should you make a costly mistake. So what is the real story of the Outer Wilds? It's sad and beautiful and relatively simple at the same time. The universe is coming to an end. The Nomai knew it, and they wanted to find out everything they could, perhaps save them, perhaps find the creator, who knows, but they did know that something that they called the Eye of the Universe exists. A massive anomaly and a signal they had found at some point that dated older than the universe itself. And they know that the solar system that we are in, that they have traveled to, is close to it. But they can't find it. It uses the same quantum elements as the quantum moon. They just don't know where it is. So what to do? Well, the only way we can really do this is by looking for it, visually. But space is a big place. Even though we know we're close to it, it could be anywhere. So they built the platform outside the star. And this platform was just to send probes out into space to visually look for the eye of the universe. Yet, it was going to take an infinite amount of probes in order to actually find it, which is how they came up with the Ash Twin Project. They had discovered, and we discover this along their route, that they could actually manipulate sending things back in time. This actually leads to some really fun endings in the game where you can break the space-time continuum, yet this is something they could do. And if they had massive amounts of power, 
absolutely astronomical amounts of power, they could send something back 22 minutes back in time. That meant they could use the probe over and over and over again until eventually it found the eye of the universe. So where to get this power? Well, we need a supernova. We need the end of the solar system. So they tried to blow up the sun. That was their plan. They were going to save their memories and their person inside the Ash Twin Project, detonate the sun, send the probe out, and it would continuously look for the eye of the universe. And then when they found it, they could break the cycle and use their ship to go there. Unfortunately, the interloper came. Just bad timing, I guess. And it wiped them all out. They built everything, but they never got to use it. And it was very, very sad. And discovering that throughout the game is emotionally quite heavy. But now, the natural heat death of the universe is happening. Purely out of coincidence, the sun in the system is going supernova on its own. And this coincidence has kicked their plan into action. After so long, it's naturally occurred, instead of waiting for them to artificially detonate that sun. And because of your interaction with a statue, you have been tied to the Ash Twin Project just so happens to be a very good day for you so here we are going round and round until we find out that one of the probes has found the eye of the universe we know where it is and now we have the vessel how to get there we found it inside dark bramble so now we can take up their journey and we can travel to the end so let's get this final loop going we've traveled to giant's deep and entered its electrified core by insulating ourselves within a jellyfish, which gave us the coordinates of the eye of the universe. We've traveled to Dark Bramble, where we've located the vessel the Nomai entered our solar system with, and we know this ship is capable of utilizing an advanced warp core in order to teleport us to the coordinates we found. We also know the only remaining advanced warp core remains in the Ash Twin project which serves as our safety net and creates the 22 minute long time loop we found ourselves in after our sun went supernova and triggered the Ash Twin project to fire our memories back in time. Now, the time has come to interrupt this loop, put our lives on the line and warp ourselves to the eye of the universe as once was the long time goal of the Nomai. First up, the Ash Twin. We need to wait a little while here until the sand starts flowing between the twins and the warp towers reveal themselves. We then warp inside the Ash Twins core and take out the advanced warp core. At this point, we've interrupted the time loop. The project will no longer generate a black hole that allows for data and memories to be sent back in time. So we need to be very careful not to die in a horrible accident at this point. Next up, Dark Bramble. This is where it gets tense. You know you have no lifeline if an anglefish gets you, but the sun is still minutes away from going supernova. That hasn't changed. It becomes a careful dance between stealth and speed as we follow the Nomai distress signal that will lead us to the seed node connected to the realm the vessel resides in. We shoot our probe into the node creating a duplicate probe we can now follow in order to find the correct entrance. We find the vessel, stranded deep within Dark Bramble, with its defect warp core floating in zero gravity as we place the last remaining one salvaged from the Ash Twin project in its slot. Now, all we need to do is enter the coordinates of the Eye of the Universe, power up the warp core, and step forward into the Abyss. Did we make it? Are we finally at the eye of the universe? Are we the first living being to have ever set foot here? It appears so, but what now? The universe is rapidly dying around us. Quantum objects are appearing and disappearing around us with vicious thunderstrikes. We stand at the edge of the precipice looking into the never-ending eye in which all things quantum seem to gather. We remember Solanum on the quantum moon, wondering what would happen if a conscious observer were to enter the eye. Well, we're about to find out as we take the plunge and... 
end up back at the Timber Hearth Observatory? At least that's what it looks like, but several details are different. The expositions around the room detail what has happened. They confirm a Hearthian has reached the eye of the universe and that our sun went supernova. Upstairs we see a small representation of our galaxy as it shows us what we feared all along. This really is the end. All of the stars in the universe have exhausted their nuclear fission material and are collapsing under their own gravity as we roam a quantum version of Timber Hearth's forest. We start to pick up similar signals as those we followed in our playthrough. The sounds of our spacefaring friends playing their signature instruments. Are they real or are they quantum versions of our friends? Does it matter? We get to be with our friends around a campfire. We get to roast our final marshmallow as we enjoy each other's company while playing music together during the final moments of the universe. As our song comes to a close, an orb appears above the campfire. Touching this orb collapses everything inside and it explodes anew, starting another universe with a big bang. Here ends our journey, which started so innocently with our maiden space voyage. We visited many inspiring locales, solved mysteries of a peace-loving civilization that had gone long silent, and gained valuable knowledge over the course of many time loops. We were unlucky enough to be born close to the end of the entire universe, yet fortunate enough to be able to celebrate its conclusion together with friends and ultimately assist in the creation of a new iteration of what it means to be a conscious observer in a mysterious universe. <laughs>